Hi, everybody. Ah, the clicker, the famous. Do you want to throw me the clicker? Ah, oh, it's underneath. I've got it. Um, it was a really fun day today, and all of it was fun, but I have to say the, uh, the hour that I spent with the... Who's here? From, I'm going to now see if they actually showed up. Who's here from the CC Design Club? Oh, good, and they all sit together. That's so sweet. Um, that was really a lot of fun, and I don't often meet with students. I'm sounding a little loud to myself. I don't know to you guys. Um, um, I don't that often meet with students, but it's always, it's always so much fun, and um, at least the ones I met, if they're representative of this institution, then it's a great institution. And I have to say, uh, thanks to Colorado Colleges, I learned to call you CC, CC Senor. And, um, uh, of course, the Downtown Partnership for bringing me here. So, um, today's March 2nd. It's my mom's birthday. And in two days, more importantly, House of Cards, season four, is coming out. Don't tell my mom I said more importantly. Um, so, I have so much to tell you today, and we're going we're gonna to have time at the end for Q&A. Um, but I actually had to insert some more things this afternoon because of the stuff that I learned um, during my walk around. So there's a ton to show you. I'm going to go super fast, um, but don't worry, it's all in the book, which you're all going to buy. Um, <clears throat> some places I go, there's no more in the title. It used to be half the places I spoke, there would be no more in the title. Um, places are getting better. As you know, downtowns are getting better. Um, Colorado Springs is definitely a place that's already pretty walkable. Uh, at least the downtown part, which is what you'll see I focused on. Um, so at least we get the more in the title, towards a more walkable Colorado Springs. There's also a talk I like to call the walkable city, and I give two ty types of talk these days. Um, I give talks on why we need it, um, which is really the first part of my book. I'm not giving you that talk. Um, I, give you, I give talks on how to do it. That's the talk today, because I only have one hour with you, and I want to make my presence here as useful as possible. Um, the Why We Need to Talk, however, is available on TED.com. So if you're interested in, 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 you know, if you're here, you probably have already, I'm not going to say, I, people say drunk the Kool-Aid, but that implies that it's somehow like poisonous and dangerous. Um, <laughs> if you're here, it probably means that you're already somewhat convinced that to be a vital city, uh, Colorado Springs needs to be a walkable city. But the purpose of this talk isn't so much to convince people as to give you the ammunition you need to convince other people. So I encourage you to, walk, to watch it, and it's, it's actually a much longer talk than the TED version, which is 18 minutes or whatever, um, but it would be useful to you, I think. Um, but tonight we're going to talk about how to do it, and we begin with this premise that walkable places are thriving places. And we ask the question then, if that's the case, um, how do you get people to walk? And the answer is what I call the general theory of walkability. It's kind of the organizational structure of my book, which I hope you will read. And um, it basically asks the question, you know, in America, in which driving is so easy and so cheap, you know, and you don't pay the full cost of driving by a long shot, and the car is sitting there in the driveway between you and everything, right? And actually, four-fifths of the cost of driving um, are the cost of owning the car, and only one-fifth is that variable cost of using the car. So if you've already made the investment in having a car, then every mile you drive is, is cheaper than the mile before. And the smart thing to do is to use it all the time. So in this condition, if we're going to create a community of people walking, how do we do that? And the answer is that the walk has to be as good as the drive, period. And to do that, you have to do four things simultaneously. And you can't just do three, you can't do two. Um, the walk has to be useful, the walk has to be safe, the walk has to be comfortable, and it has to be interesting. And that's the structure of of my talk tonight. So we'll start with The Reason to Walk, which is a story um, I learned from my mentors, Andres Duani and Elizabeth Plater Zyberg, who founded the New Urbanism Movement. And Andres used to give this great talk called The Story of Planning, and he talked about how, you know, back in the 19th century, people were literally choking on the soot from the dark satanic mills, and the planners, who weren't then called planners, said, hey, let's, let's move the housing away from the mills. You know, let's make the worker housing at some distance from these factories. And they did it, and of course, lifespans increased immediately and dramatically, and the planners were hailed as heroes. And we like to say they've been trying to repeat that victory ever since. So the onset of Euclidean zoning, the dividing of the landscape into these large areas of only single use, where um, you know, commercial is separated from retail and you know, office 
from medical office and high density housing from lower density housing. And we now know as planners, like we learn in school now, <coughs> thanks to the new urbanists mostly, and Jane Jacobs before them, we learn that this is wrong. Yet most places I land to do a project, if there's a plan on the land already, it's usually a plan just like this. So we have this whole armature, this hidden, this hidden armature that's under the ground in, all these, in most of America that's poised to create more of this, where by the sheer size and separation of the different uses, the walk can't be useful unless we create new rules um, to overrule it. So I always say, you know, I was, I was an art history major, which they say isn't that valuable. Um, but I can say you don't want a Rothko, you want a Seurat. <laughs> right? Seurat was the pointillist. And you can see, you know, the most walkable cities have this finest confetti-like scattering of so many different uses, but it's such small grain. And then, of course, the red in this slide is vertically mixed use. So it's mixed use on the given site. And so the main, the main uh, point to be made is if you're going to zone at all by use, then you want confetti, not blobs, right? And then, of course, there's this whole new movement you may have heard about towards form-based zoning as opposed to use-based zoning. And Colorado Springs is fairly early, thanks to the wisdom of its planning department. Uh, since 2009, you have had a form-based code in your downtown area. Yes, congratulate yourselves. <clears throat> so um, this brings me, though, in talking about you know, the foundation of the work that we do in sharing the principal story of the new urbanists, which I tell everywhere I go because it's the most important story I've ever heard. Um, and basically, it's that there's only two tested ways to make communities. Like, there's a thousand ways to make a town, but there's only two things we've done by the thousands. One is the traditional neighborhood, uh, and the other is suburban sprawl. And those are the only two things that we have many of to study and see what works and what doesn't. The traditional neighborhood, and these are several different neighborhoods of Newburyport, Massachusetts, um, is defined as being diverse, compact, and walkable. Um, you can see in terms of diversity, there are places to live of different size, places to work, places to shop, places to worship, places to recreate. You know, most of your daily needs are within walking distance. That walking distance is typically about a five minute walk, so a quarter mile, and you find that most neighborhoods throughout history and across cultures are about a half mile across, which is a, a five minute walk from edge to center. Um, and then they're walkable because there's lots of streets. And because there's lots of streets, no one street needs to be particularly big. In contrast, sprawl, which, you know, this, this was not an invention. This was a natural evolution in response to man's needs. In contrast, sprawl was an invention after the war, under the, you know, based on the presumption of universal automobile use. And it's clearly not compact, as the name and image would suggest. It's not diverse. You know, whole square miles will hold just one use, or sometimes just one house, over and over and over again. Um, and it's not walkable because so few of the streets actually connect. Most streets are loops and cul-de-sacs. And so the few streets that do connect um, become overburdened with all the traffic. They become, therefore, designed around moving the traffic as quickly as possible. We call them automobile sewers. And they're noxious. So you see the houses even turn their backs to them. And look at all this infrastructure that doesn't have a single address on it. It's all backs and walls. And what a waste, you know, of investment. All of this roadway that does only one thing, which is to move cars around. Um, so it's fun to break sprawl down into its constituent parts, the places where you only live, where you only work, where you only shop. Um, civic institutions supersized around, um, you know, maybe the, the pride of the school board or the convenience of the janitor, but the size of the parking lot compared to the size of this high school tells you all you need to know. You know, as you move school, as you, as you make schools bigger, because there's this trend, right? There's this trend towards consolidation of schools. As you make schools bigger, that means you push them further away, right? That's just what has to happen. And so, you know, no, no child has ever walked to this school. No child will ever walk to this school. The seniors and the juniors are driving the sophomores and the freshmen with the death rates to prove it. And then, you know, Weston, outside of Fort Lauderdale, is very proud of its, you know, eight soccer fields and eight baseball diamonds. But this is why we have the soccer mom in America. You know, when I was young, I had one soccer field. 
and two baseball diamonds, but they were in my neighborhood. So this, this, this urge towards consolidation, supersizing, and therefore separation, and then you know, never mind the canals and everything else, so that the child who lives here, it's a one mile drive. And of course, you're not gonna let the child walk because this car sewer is noxious and you wouldn't let them bike on it, it's just too fast. So the part that we forgot to count, you know, when Frank Lloyd Wright imagined Broadacre City and everyone had their, had their acre, and the housing is separated from the office, and everything's separated from everything else and reconnected only with automotive infrastructure, Frank Lloyd Wright had personal helicopters, so that helped. But when all you've got is automotive infrastructure, then of course the, this federal and state highway system, which was created you know, for commerce and for vacation travel, has basically become a commuting way. And um, I tell people it's a two-part deal. The latest poll, 10% of Americans want this. 60% of Americans want a house where they can walk to stuff from. And 40% don't know. <laughs> but 10%, this, for 10% of Americans, this is still the American dream. Uh, but this dream comes with this nightmare. Often to absurd extremes. And the investment that we make in the horizontal infrastructure, you know, and rob our schools and our churches and our other civic buildings, because, you know, this has to function perfectly. And why do we do that? You know, why do, our, why do our civic buildings look so cheap and our roads look so beautiful? And I, I figured it out. And the reason is that this environment is so completely banal and mind-numbing that if you have to sit at this light for more than one light cycle, you just want to kill yourself. <laughs> so that's why we can't allow that to happen ever, right? So driving is no fun. <laughs> this is not Photoshop, this is a real place. Um, and it's stressful. The stress that it puts on our families, and particularly the moms usually, who are doing all the driving, it's very hard. Uh, you know, driving is bad, and, and walking can be, can be even worse. So. Um, the epidemiologists have been showing this slide for 15 years. You may have seen this slide before. I got it from Dr. Dr. Howie Frumpkin, who's an epidemiologist, and they make the point now, an incredible book that came out in two, 2004, Urban Sprawl and Public Health. And they say, you know, there's a reason why we have the first generation of American children who are expected to live shorter, shorter lives than their parents. And fully a third of all children born after 2000 are expected to become diabetic by the CDC. Because we have, you know, diet is part of it, but it's only part of it. Inactivity is, the, is a huge part of it. And we've legislated out of existence the useful walk. Right? It just doesn't exist. We used to walk to get stuff done, and now we can't. So the idea, you know, the fact that you can drive to park to take the escalator to the gym to get on the treadmill to exercise just shows you how crazy as a society we've become. So this is the model then. And, and the rest of my talk is going to be about, in a minute, is going to be about the places you already have. But it's important to say, you know, when it comes to building new places, just understand there's only two models. There's the sprawl model and there's the neighborhood model, and it's the same stuff. But how big is the stuff? And is there a network? Or is there what's called a dendritic branching system of arterials, collectors, local roads? Because the great irony of sprawl is that it was designed entirely around the automobile, but it works worse for automobiles. Because, you know, God help you, if there's one engine fire on this collector road, the entire city shuts down, right? Whereas there's 10, 10 ways to get anywhere in this diagram. So I just wanted to mention as we finish this up, you know, this is what new development looks like when it's that and not that. And this is a project that you may recognize, half built, um, that I did 17 years ago for Earl Robertson, got the laser sight. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, um, and, you know, it didn't, didn't help that his partner was layman and you guys had a recession. Um, but we're, but it's, it's, it's half done and the good news is it's, it's kicking back in again. So, you know, and when you're a city planner, by the way, easily half the stuff you do never gets built. And half the stuff that gets built doesn't turn out exactly the way you've planned it. But you want to lay in a good framework, that network of streets, you know, blocks, that continue the existing city grid, and then, of course, opportunities for mixed use. Where is that? Uh, this is just south of the heart of downtown. It's on Animas. Is this Animas? Yeah. Los Animas and, and Nevada. This is the old Lowell School. It's called the Lowell Neighborhood. So you can see it's part built, slightly changed, and when it's complete, it will be much like that diagram. So there's the, uh, 
charrette rendering. And here's the building. It's about the closest a building has ever come to a charrette rendering. Um, and then unfortunately, across the street, there's this empty site. But actually, this is now um, in design development, will be built. And according to Earl, this is my favorite developer quote ever, it's going to have a lot of architecture in it. <laughs> um, but the architect is Mark Tremel, who's very, who's very good, who did this building. So uh, yeah, so it's going to be. It's going to be great. I sound like Trump. It's going to be great. We're going to be winning and winning. Um, but then this is another development that I got to show you because, you know, full disclosure and, and understanding the work we do is hard. But this is, um, this is Spring Creek. And it's a, one of the largest projects. So I, my team and I laid this out. You can see it's about half built, 700 homes already, another 1,000 or so uh, units coming. And, and it, it was a bit of a compromise. Um, but this is a retail area, so this is all residential. This is a retail area that's kind of waiting for its second generation to come um, because it, it's not very nice right now. Um, but even when you're doing just a residential area, you can see, look, this is something that, that probably has never happened in this part of Colorado Springs before. You've got single family houses next to row houses next to apartments, all on one block and pedestrian streets and some of the nicest streets that you can live on for $200,000, right, to buy a house in this community. So I'm very pleased with, you know, everything's a compromise, but I'm very pleased with, with my opportunity to, to, to work here. Um, so that's, that's that. Now, moving on to your, your downtown. Remember, this is the category of the useful walk. You have to ask your question. Oh, first of all, let me see, I'm going to talk about your downtown. And everything I'm saying about your downtown really applies to your downtowns. It applies to... Um, uh, sorry, old, down, old Colorado City, old Colorado City, and anywhere else that you've got that's kind of pre-war. For your, for your post-war stuff, and your city is so huge, and it contains square mile after square mile of pure single-use sprawl on that dendritic, you know, bad model. It's very hard. Now, you can do things to make it more walkable, more livable, more sustainable, and you should, by introducing bike trails and other stuff to make it better, but the kind of walkability I'm talking about is robust, useful walkability, and that's really only possible in places that have pre-war street networks. Unless you're going to completely put in a new street network that's got blocks, and we, we've been doing that too. By the way, you know, the new urbanists have been turning a lot of shopping malls and office parks and other things into mixed-use town centers. Has anyone been to Belmar outside of Denver? So that's a good example, for example, of a, of a dead mall that became a mixed-use town center. But the greatest opportunities for walkability are in the places that are already somewhat walkable and in the places that already have some mixed use and where improving the mix of uses will not be fought by neighbors. If you think it's easy to introduce commercial to a residential area, try putting a 7-Eleven on a residential cul-de-sac and see what happens, right? So the real opportunities are in our downtowns, and particularly the heart of, of Colorado Springs. And so when you look at this downtown area, you ask the question, in all these uses, what is missing and underrepresented? And typically, it's housing. And your, your housing, your jobs to housing ratio here, believe me, a lot of American cities do a lot worse, but your jobs to housing ratio in your downtown area is 11 to 1, right? The closer you can get it, bless you, the closer you can get it to 1 to 1, the more, see, when, the, when the housing kicks in, all these other things start kicking in so much better. Jane Jacobs talking about Wall Street back in the 1960s when Wall Street was a very different place. She said, you know why there's no good, no great restaurants on Wall Street, no great gym on Wall Street? A great restaurant and a great gym needs both, both lunchtime and nighttime clients. So once you get that housing to jobs balance going, then everything else really gets better. Now here's another question, I say it only because I, I had to dig this out of my older slides, because only in some communities is it relevant, but in, in, with the intention of getting more housing and doing so in a way that's attainable, what is valuable in being wasted? In many cases, that's your parking, and specifically your structured parking. And I want to tell in one minute the story of Lowell, Massachusetts, where I did a downtown master plan, where they had all these beautiful old mills that they were trying to, the city wanted to see renovated, and wanted to turn into housing because the industry had gone away. You know, this is the birthplace of the American Re uh, of the Industrial Revolution in the U.S. And the um, developers who were asked to take these over 
were, were being asked, as they always are, by their lenders to the money for these apartments if you provide parking. If you don't provide parking, it's not a bankable asset. They said, well, where are we going to put parking in this area? There's really not very much. And the city said, well, actually, we've got five, we've got five downtown lots. And these lots are principally empty overnight and have some empty spaces during the day. And they actually, the city wrote letters and handed the letters to the developers. And the letters said, I assign these parking spaces to your building. And the, letter, the, the builders took those letters to their banks and they got the loans. And now these buildings are all renovated. They're all full of people. And you know, that's a huge savings if you don't have to build parking or create parking associated with these buildings. So I advocate that you look into that downtown. A, lot of, uh, a number of other cities I visited have done this have made partnerships between downtown parking for overnight for residents. Because, of course, it's a perfectly complementary load. It's what we call a complementary load. The workers, <coughs> the people leave, leave the garage to go to their job, and the workers leave their, their homes and come and park in the garage, and they just take turns. So that's called garages leveraging housing. Um, and here in your downtown, I noticed at least two darn big parking garages that I'm told are mostly empty at night. And then the other part of the useful walk is transit. And you know, you can have a perfectly walkable neighborhood without transit, but walkable cities really rely on transit because if you don't connect the walkable areas to each other, then even those people who want the, lo the walkable lifestyle, they're going to buy a car. And then the city continues to shape itself around the needs of people who drive. So it is important to have a, a, a more robust transit system than I'm told you currently have. Um, and Bikes, bike share is transit. It's extremely helpful to transit. In, in Washington, D.C., we've seen both bike share trips replacing transit trips and bike share trips being connected to transit trips. Um, almost every city that's introduced bike share has had a good experience. You do have to fund it, at least to some degree, but you have to fund transit too. But understand, it's a very healthy form of transit. So that's the first category. The second category is the big one. The last two categories are very short. So I'm going to spend most of the rest of our time on this concept of the safe walk. And the safe walk used to be about crime. It's not really about that anymore. It's about surviving automobiles and that feeling that you have a fighting chance against being struck and killed by one. And it all pretty much boils down to design speed. The fact that if you're hit by a car going 35, you are eight times as likely to die than if you're hit by a car going 25. And that cusp between you know, 25 and 35 is where most people drive in the city, right? unless you're on Platte driving 50. But you know, that cusp is a really important cusp that all the signals that drivers receive from the different elements of the streetscape are telling them whether they should be going over 30 or under 30. And so that's what we need to address. And you students, you, know, you college students and high school students, it's really for you, because you're not looking where you're going anymore. <laughs> so the first, at, the first thing, the first clue that, te, that, that determines how fast people drive is block size. This is uh, Portland, Oregon, famously walkable, famously 200-foot blocks, tiny blocks among the tiniest blocks in America. This is Salt Lake City, famously unwalkable, famously 600-foot blocks. At some of these intersections, there are bins with orange flags that you're supposed to hold up as you cross the street. I'm not kidding you. <clears throat> And if you look at them, I mean, they're so different from each other. And the, the thing is that you know, a 200-foot a block city can be principally a two-lane city, whereas a 600-foot block city, because there are so few roads, is principally a, principally a six-lane city, at least when you develop it to this, to this density. These are mostly six-lane streets. Look at the statistics. When you, this is 24 different California cities. When you double the block size, you quadruple almost the number of non-highway fatalities. It's a clear correlation. Here's your downtown at the same scale. And you're not doing as well as Portland, but most places aren't. Your blocks are 400 feet. Now, I should say Portland is extreme. Salt Lake is also extreme. So here you are next to Portland. Here you are next to Salt Lake. So you, you could be doing better, but you're not doing that badly. And here's what we say, you know, the classic urbanist pronunciation, you know, pronouncement, your bones are good. Like a 400-foot block city is a, is a walkable, can be a walkable city, um, as long as that network is maintained. And the principal lesson from a planning perspective is fight those impulses to mega block. Hospitals like to mega block. Universities like to mega block. Developers sometimes like to mega block. Certainly with your 
foot blocks, you should not ever be consolidating them uh, into super blocks. Um, next, obviously, is the number of lanes. And this is a conversation I have wherever I go, and I have to have wherever I go. Uh, one of the great intellectual black holes in planning is the concept of induced demand, which applies to highways and also to city streets like yours. <clears throat> this is the theory of traffic planning. You have a congested system because the demand, the number of drivers, is greater than the capacity of the road. So you widen the road in order to absorb those trips, which would work if this theory was correct. <laughs> but the theory isn't correct because in congested systems, the principal constraint to driving is congestion. So actually, particularly when gas is so cheap, but even when it wasn't, the principal way that we're made to pay for our motoring lives is in time wasted in traffic. And when that time wasted in traffic goes away, you take trips that you wouldn't have taken otherwise. Or you stop carpooling. Or you commute more on the exact peak hour. Or you move further away from your job because these highways have made it so easy for you to do that. And so the experience happens over and over again. And this is now completely acknowledged in the profession. You know, this is Newsweek magazine from like eight years ago. Today's engineers acknowledge that building new roads usually make traf makes traffic worse. Yet, every day, cities are making decisions in complete ignorance of this understanding. And they say, we need that extra lane because the traffic is coming. And then you build the lane. And this happened in several of my projects. You build the extra lanes because they make you, and the traffic comes and fills them. And they say, see, I told you that you needed those extra lanes. So here's the study. It was presented at the Paris School of Economics. Very straightforward. Actually, I have no idea what this means. But <laughs> I do know what this means, and it's the data from highway after highway and street after street. When you add capacity, 40% of that new capacity is taken up by new trips on day one, and within four years, 100% of the capacity is taken up with new trips. We saw it on the 405 in, in New York. We saw it on um, the Katy Freeway in Houston, um, you know, $8 billion essentially thrown away. And the story is, and this is, this is about 15 years ago that this report was issued by the Intermodal Study Network, ICE-T, I forget what it's called. Metro areas that invested heavily in road capacity expansion fared no better in easing congestion than those that did not. They basically spent money to lengthen their commutes. So, now I don't really, my impression of speaking to you is that congestion really isn't a problem here. If anyone is widening any streets, however, and saying it's because of congestion, you have to remind them that that is technically impossible to do. That, 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 that actually it's a falsehood to say that they're doing that. Um, and then you have a whole bunch of streets <coughs> that seem to me, <coughs> especially the state highways, to be certainly wide enough, right? Um, but it's important when you think about investing in a road that I mean investing in streets is investing in mobility. And mobility is wealth. Mobility generates wealth. And if you're not doing it to fight congestion, there, there can be reasons to widen streets or to build new streets. Um, but just understand that there's hidden costs, there's indirect costs, right? So if you as a biker spend a dollar, then actually society is paying eight cents to help you make your commute. And if you pay a dollar to get on the bus, actually you're being subsidized a dollar fifty, roughly, by the city. But if you pay a dollar to drive, society is paying, and nowadays, because gas costs so much less, this is probably more like fifteen dollars, right? So there's all these hidden costs of roadways, of ambulances, right, of other municipal services that circle around our, our roads that mean that as a city, the wise economic choice is to invest in the mode of transportation that has the fewest the fewest hidden costs, right? And just one more thing about induced demand, which is the opposite is also true. We call it re reduced demand. But when highways come down, the trips just go away. And this is a surprise to everyone. But it happened with the, with the West Side Highway in New York City. It happened with the Embarcadero Freeway in San Francisco after the Loma Prieta earthquake, when the highway was damaged and had to come down. And they replaced it with a boulevard. And there was no Carmageddon. You know, the car trips just went away. People adjusted their behavior. And of course, the increase in real estate value in the surrounding 
dozens of square miles, you know, the linear miles of turning this into this, um, you know, is paid in terms of increased tax revenue based on increased revenue, val revenue uh, rev real estate value to the city has paid for the conversion many times over. So just something to think about. So I have this conversation, this induced demand conversation everywhere I go, and then I move on. Because I may have convinced you intellectually, but it's just so hard to win. It's not just the traffic engineers. The traffic engineers know this, but the public doesn't get it. And you may get it, but most people don't get it. And most people will still fight for extra lanes when they have congestion. So I move on and I say there's a much more useful question we can ask, which is where do you actually have excess capacity? And this is, the, this is my, you know, there's a takeaway from my talk tonight and my visit here. It's that if you look at your streets, you know, it's, 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 it's pure math. It's not even algebra, it's just math. It's addition, it's, it's multiplication. A lane of traffic holds a certain, a lane holds a certain amount of traffic. And your streets are experiencing a certain amount of traffic. Your streets have a certain amount of lanes. You will find a mismatch on many of your streets between the number of lanes you have and the amount of traffic you have. And that's an opportunity. So in Oklahoma City, when they were named by Prevention Magazine in the best walking cities issue as the worst city for pedestrians in the entire country, they called me up, the Mayor, mayor Cornette called me up and said, help, what do we do about this? <clears throat> and I said, let's do a walkability study. And we looked at the car counts in the downtown area. And this is the heart of Oklahoma City. And you can see these car counts. Um, and we know that a two-lane road can handle 10,000 cars per day. Every engineer will agree. Two lanes, 10,000 cars. And we looked at these car counts, 6,000, 9,000, 3,000, 5,000, 7,000. These were the streets that were in the brand new downtown plan designated as four to six lane roads. So Sheridan, 10,000, Hudson, 8,000, 5,000, 5,000, 4,000. And so you had a street like this six laner that could easily be a two laner. And I called their attention, and I know this is happening here, I, I can tell it very clearly. And I called their attention to this, and fortunately, um, my walkability study was issued the same day that Devon Energy decided to build this tower in the heart of downtown. And the tower was generating a $200 million tax increment. And they said, what should we spend this money on? And some very wise person said, let's rebuild every city street in the downtown, the 40-block urban core, let's rebuild every, single, every city street from building face to building face and right-size it to the anticipated congestion, that we're, to the anticipated number of trips that we're going to get. So it was my job to design the curb to curb of all of these streets, and we right-sized the number of, you know, we, we anticipate some growth. We didn't just choke it on where it is right now. But in, in making the streets the right size, we were able to double the amount of on-street parking, which the merchants loved, and um, create a robust bike network where there was no bike network at all. So a street like this, um, you know, four lanes to an intersection becomes two lanes. Uh, here it is under construction. And then one of the major arterials through the downtown, Sheridan, had to keep its four lanes plus the turn lane, but we narrow the lanes. You fit a bike lane in, um, add a median, and you know, this is the old economy buying the new economy. And unfortunately, with $50 a barrel gasoline, this is like two-thirds done and it's come to a screeching halt. Um, but hopefully it'll, you know, we all want gas to cost more. Maybe not you, but I certainly want gas to cost more. Um, and when it does, um, this will complete itself. But this is what you do when you have money. And most cities don't have money, but it's important, it's an important lesson. But the, the other lesson I like to share is, you know, what do you do if you don't have that kind of money? And that's what I do in most of the places I go. This is Cedar Rapids. They had the same condition. Four-lane streets everywhere, two-lane volumes everywhere. And um, they were about to spend $3 million to rebuild this one street. And I said, why rebuild one street when for the, for the same price you can restripe the whole downtown? <laughs> Striping is cheap. You know, when you rebuild, you have to fix the drainage. You have to really spend a lot of money on very small areas. And so I say, don't rebuild, restripe. So with paint and signals, we're turning this number of lanes, mostly four, into this, mostly two. And that turns this parking network, where red is angle, into this parking network. And it turns this bike network into this bike network. 
And actually, we're not spending any money on it, essentially, because what's happening is as they make repairs over the years, this is about an eight-year build-out, as they make repairs over the years, they're fixing the streets as they repave them, right? And also, we're saving a ton of money on signals, which I'll explain later, which helps pay for it. So um, these streets were half one way. Oklahoma City streets were half one way. We're, we made them all two way. And this is the next point I want to raise with you, which you've already experienced with Tejon which is that one-way streets are also, multi-lane one-way streets are also more dangerous than if the same street is a two-way street. Why is that? Well, there's no opposing traffic, which is, you know, tells cars to slow down. There's the sheer mass of all these cars moving in the same direction. Um, but mostly, it's because of the opportunity to jockey. And, you know, whenever you're in a lane and there's another lane, you know that other lane is faster than your lane, and you want to get in it. But your mentality as a driver, just think about your own experience, your mentality as a driver when you're stuck behind someone and you can't do a darn thing about it is profoundly different than your mentality when there's another lane that you could be going faster in. You know, when there's only one lane in each direction, you look around, you might observe the shops, you might see a pedestrian or a bicyclist. Here, you're just trying to get home as fast as you can. And so the experience, and traffic engineers are notoriously bad at doing these studies, but a few have been done mostly not by traffic engineers. In Louisville, when they converted back, you know, these streets were all two-way once, right? They were originally all two-way. When they converted Brook and First back to two-way and left second and third as one-way, on the two-ways, car crashes went down 48% and crime went down 23%. On the one-ways, car crashes went up 15% and crime went up 36%. But the real story is an economic story. It's a business development story. And it was told very nicely in Governing Magazine in 2009 by Alan Ehrenholt um, about Vancouver, Washington. And Vancouver, Washington is the place that was tested properly, although this has been done in many places starting in the 90s, these reversions back to two-way travel. And Vancouver tried every trick in the book from the 80s to re-live in their moribund Main Street. The bricks, the berms, the banners, the bandstands, the bollards, the balloons. You know, all the, all the quick fixes of the 80s and 90s. And nothing worked until they reverted the two-way street back to, sorry, the one-way street back to two-way. And according to the merchants, the, the revenues, uh, their revenues doubled immediately. The amount of traffic was the same, but it was split in two directions. People were driving at a slower pace. The stores were getting both morning and evening traffic, and so they came back. Um, East Broad Street in Savannah, lest you ever think you might want to turn any of your two-way streets into one way, as you know, which was the epidemic of the 60s and 70s, Broad Street in Savannah, when it was converted one way in 69, 64% of the businesses that were paying taxes went away. And then they converted it back in 1990 to two-way, and it, almost immediately there was a 50% gain in businesses. Um, <clears throat> so, citizens understand this. You've got a pair left in your downtown, Bijou and Kiowa, that is under consideration. All evidence would suggest that the right thing to do is to revert it uh, back to, to two-way traffic. Um, you can see, and because of the angle parking, you would think that cars wouldn't drive that fast, but now that I've been here, and I wasn't just looking at, at Google, I can tell you, dri cars drive very fast on these streets. Um, they're just, they're, they feel like speedways. And then there's the question, well, what do you do? Because they come from a highway ramp. How do you make it work so that they can be two-way? And the answer is that you start at Cascade, right? You make them two-way beginning at Cascade, but one-way, Bijou can stay one-way, and Kiowa can stay one-way west of Cascade. So it's an easy solution. And then what do you say? Well, what's going to happen to traffic? How are we going to handle, how are people going to get into downtown without those streets? And my answer is, I don't know. How do people get into downtown when those were your streets? Because at some point, that wasn't even there, right? So I know it will work out. Um, next is the width of the lanes. And we've had this mission creep in America where lanes have been getting wider and wider and wider. Andre Stuani used to show this slide, and he'd say, the typical street to the typical subdivision in America is wide enough to allow you to experience the curvature of the earth. <laughs> and it's true. So this is a subdivision from the 60s, and this is a subdivision from the 80s. Same height of airplane, same size of house. Look at what's happened to our road standards. 
These are both in the Washington area, D.C. This is my old street in South Beach in Miami, which wasn't draining properly, so we had to rebuild the curbs, and the new standard kicked in, and we lost all our trees and half our sidewalk because somehow it wasn't wide enough before, when it had worked perfectly well. Wider streets are faster streets. A 10-foot lane is a 30-mile-an-hour lane. A 12-foot lane is a 70-mile-an-hour lane. You know this as a driver. It's what you experience, and you know it on the highway. And when you're in a 12-foot lane, you are happy going 70. One study suggests that 900 people a year are killed by our streets being too wide. So my question is, how long will it take for us to act on this knowledge? Because we now know this, and the leadership in transportation engineering understands it. Citizens certainly understand it, you know, demanding narrower streets in their neighborhood. In Portland, they have this tremendous, you know, Portland, Oregon, the most progressive planning city in America, probably, uh, has the Skinny Streets program. And now we're talking about residential streets. And this is a particular type of street with single family houses on it that isn't carrying through traffic. In which case, you can have what's called a, a queuing street or a yield street, where a single lane is handling traffic in two directions. And we build them everywhere we go. We always have to change the law to do so. This is Ion outside of Charleston, South Carolina. The developer, Vince Graham, built these streets. He goes to conferences. He's a great public speaker. And he shows these streets at his conferences. And he brags about his skinny streets. And he quotes this famous philosopher who said, broad is the road that leads to destruction. Narrow is the road that leads to life. I'm in the Bible Belt, right? So listen to this guy. Um, so, but the real question is, what about your city streets, not your residential, you know, single family streets, but your typical streets in your city that are carrying or will carry uh, enough traffic to be through and have a lane in each direction? And the answer is this, which was hijacked from a recent presentation by the guy who's written the new ITE traffic engineering handbook. 10 feet should be the default width for general purpose lanes at speeds of 45 miles per hour or less. Based on everything I've seen around the city, your standard is 11 feet, which isn't that much of a difference. I'm about to show you it's a very big difference. But understand that 11 feet is fine if you want people going more than 45 miles an hour. It's that simple. Severity of impact and travel lane width. This is a study it was done in Europe, but still pertains. This is a 10-foot lane. This is an 11-foot lane. 10 times the severity of impact when lanes are a foot wider. So it's important. And then there's streets like Platt. I could show you many different streets. Start here. Um, so what have you got? A travel lane, a travel lane, and a parking lane. Parking lanes used to be 7, and they were 7.5. Now, OK, we can make it 8. 10, 10, 8. Should be 28 feet. What is it? 35 feet. So what are you saying? You're saying highway lanes, highway speeds. And this is why people go 45 and 50 on the street that's marked as 35 miles an hour. Then you've got these streets. Holy cow. Like this part of Los Animas. Let's say 7 and a half, 7 and a half, 10, 10. It should be 35. No, oh, it's 55. So I don't know. I mean, this is the wagon train, you know. This should be in Utah kind of street but obviously an opportunity. What does this represent? When you have extra lanes, as I've said, or extra wide lanes, it's an opportunity to put other stuff in the roadway. It could be angled, angled cars. It could be bike facilities. Perhaps should be bike facilities. Now, I just want to say, I've been picking on engineers a lot. <laughs> Everything I've learned about traffic engineers, I've learned from traffic engineers. So they're not my enemy. Everything I'm teaching you about traffic engineering, I learned from traffic engineers. There are some really good ones out there. You just have to make sure that they're calling the shots and not those who disagree with anything that I say, which is all correct. <laughs> um, bicycling, as you are well aware, I like to say bicycling is the biggest revolution currently underway in only some American cities. And the main lesson, the main lesson in biking is that it's a function of infrastructure. Climate matters a little. Topography matters a little. Culture matters a little. But what really matters is infrastructure. Those places that invest in cycling are the places that create the cycling population. So, you know, this is Portland. I asked my, in Portland, they invested $30 million 
over 20 years, they invested $30 million in biking, which, by the way, is less than half what they spent to fix one clover leaf, right? So it's not a lot of money. But they invested $30 million, and they went from biking the same as the rest of America to biking 15 times as much as the rest of America. And their peak time commutes went down 11 minutes. Went down. The only city in America, their peak time commutes went down 11 minutes for drivers. So I asked my friend Tom Brennan to send me some pictures of the biking, you know, in Portland. And I said, well, what was it? Was this bike to work day? He said, no, this is Tuesday in Portland. <laughs> but, you know, it's the infrastructure that does it. Chicago, you may be aware, um, introducing a ton of bike infrastructure. This is the gold standard. The buffered bike lane, the parallel parking that was here, is pulled off the curb. Door buffer, bike lanes in one or two directions. This guy's in the wrong lane. Um, this is the kind of bike lane that gets people to take the bike out of the basement and become cyclists again. If you don't provide safe bike infrastructure, the only bicyclists you get are the mammals, middle-aged men in Lycra. That's all you get. This is Chicago again. Now, paint them green. What is this green stripe? This green stripe says that Chicago is a progressive city. It's a city of the future. It's a healthy city. It's a city that wants young people to live there. It's the best advertising you can possibly have, although it still does not stop this person from being in the wrong lane. <laughs> This is Prospect Park West in, in New York City, in Brooklyn. A three-laner became a two-laner, plus a buffered bike lane. Number of cyclists, of course, tripled. Speeding, look at, the, look at how many people were speeding before. Speeding dropped precipitously. Injury crashes for all users down precipitously. And unbelievably, the traffic congestion hasn't gotten any worse. So on this street and the parallel streets, there's been no reduction in throughput of vehicles, even though there are fewer lanes. So, you know, if you do this, you get cyclists. If you don't market, they don't come. And so, you know, in, in Pasadena, they say every lane is a bike lane. Well, that means no lane is a bike lane. This is the only cyclist I met in Pasadena <laughs> because there's no real population of cyclists. So it's not a cult. You know it's all very real. Denver. You know, the CEOs of the tech companies are saying we need more bike lanes. I understand that's happening here, too, if you want to attract young, educated talent. Um, and then you look at, okay, and, and I know you've made progress. And let me say, I congratulate you on the progress you've made. And you guys are, are doing it. It is happening. And every street that I was shown today that's kind of in the works is, you know, going to have bike facilities in it. But, you know, I discovered this one on, uh, is it Kiowa? Or the other one, Bijou, Bijou, Kiowa. But I mean, look, it's a four-foot bike lane. The standard is five, and the new standard is six. Don't go beyond six. If you go beyond six, cars will find a way to drive in it. But <laughs> six is the new standard. Well, how can we make that four a six? There's just not room. Oh, gee, our lanes are 11 feet wide, right? <laughs> so here's a simple condition of, you know, this is brand new paint. When it comes time to restripe, if you make the lanes 10 feet wide, you've got your six-foot bike lane. And then you've got this condition. So people ask me, Jeff, how do you feel about rear end angle parking? And I say, I want you to have it, but I don't want the one to be the one to bring it to you because people hate it. The rear end angle, right? People hate it. It's not much safer than front end parking, except when you have bikes. When you have bikes, for reasons you can see, front end parking is actually a disaster. So you want to think about, for example, when you make this two way, keep the cars the way they are, allow one side to be rear end, and put the bike lane against that side. Do you understand what I'm saying? So these cars will be coming at us now, they will back into park, and you should have a one-way bike lane heading this way, and its partner will be on Ki Ki Kiowa. Kiowa. You split it, split it between the two streets. Parallel or angle parking. Curb parking is an essential barrier of steel that protects the sidewalk from moving vehicles. People forget how important it is to make sidewalks feel safe. Here's proof. Here's happy hour in Fort Lauderdale, famous for its happy hour. This is the side you're allowed to park on. This is the side you're not. This is the parked side of happy hour. This is the not parked side of happy hour. And this guy went out of business. No one wants to be sitting next to cars zooming by. Now, if you have a buffered bike lane or some really wide bike lane or something else, that can help. But nothing is as good as parallel parking or angle parking to protect the sidewalk. And, of course, you have your streets that suffer um, in that regard. Wait, is that you or is that from another city? That's Houston. 
Houston has streets that... Sorry. I always mess up one slide. I've got yours coming up in a minute. But I, I want to say, actually, um, because your streets are so wide, very few of them don't have parking. So this is actually not a problem that you suffer from. But right outside of this auditorium, Cascade, for some bizarre reason, has parallel parking all along it on the east flank of the street that disappears for this block, turning the right lane in, it, in, in Cascade to a 19-foot lane. And that needs fixing. Um, and then street trees. So the other part of this picture is the street trees, which, as we know, slow cars down. And we know that it slows cars down like this, but actually the studies show that when you put street trees next to a street, cars drive more slowly and more safely. So that's an important ingredient, too. You're doing very well with the parallel parking, uh, not so well with the street trees. And this is how a street feels when you don't have those things. Swoops. This is what I call objective journalism. This is the Las Vegas sun. Some say the entrance to city center is not inviting to pedestrians. <laughs> oh, really? When you have stream form geometric swoops and, and you know, anything aerodynamic, it says this is an environment for, for cars and not for people. So swoops are generally to be avoided. You know, and you know where you have your swoops. It's almost always a state DOT coming in and imposing swoops on your grid, and you can't let that happen anymore. Swoops are always destructive. You know, this is, you know, it'd be nice to have some trees also, and maybe some parking, but you know, this is where you speed up to see how many G's you can make around that corner. <laughs> and then all the details. So we've been showing this slide for 20 years, but the point is that you know, this is why we need generalists to be the designers of the city and not the, not the specialists who so often control the design of the city. Because yes, this street in Tampa will be bone dry within 30 seconds of the 100-year flood, but this woman has to mount this curb every day. So I'm most interested in the non-emergency, you know, the non-emergency condition. So this is, this is art. This is not a real place. Uh, it's a real place, but um, this, is, this is a set of slides that I've added because I realized in my conversations and my experience that it's a real opportunity here. I believe you're over-signaled. And the data, as I'll show you, makes it very clear that a, a signalized intersection is much more dangerous than a four-way stop. Now, not, this is in uh, Eugene, Oregon. Um, and this is, just, if you, this is just a delight, this intersection. Because you know, at a four-way stop, at every four-way stop, cars never go fast because they have to stop at the intersection. There's a ton of eye contact. right? Pedestrians generally rule. They're allowed to go, and the bikes just blow through as you know. And when you have a limited amount of, of cars, in, you, know, you have to have a certain amount of cars to gain a warrant to earn a signal in many places. But in many other places, um, the signals are put in without the proper warrants. And what happened in Philadelphia was in 1997, they had 472 signals that were no longer warranted because the state rules changed. And they had to take the signals out and replace them with four-way stop signs. And when they did, they collected data on almost 200. Crashes went down 24%, injuries went down 63%, and severe pedestrian injuries went down 68%. So the data is very clear. If you have a condition where, and it's typically where a two-lane one, where a two-lane two-way crosses a two-lane two-way, probably you don't need a signal. And I noticed recently in Austin, that at rush hour in Austin, they now turn all the, flash, all the lights to flashing red. And so every intersection, even though it's multi-lane one-ways, every intersection is, a, is a, a officially, a, effectively a four-way stop sign. This is funny. Traffic engineers in Philadelphia believe that the safety benefit stems from the elimination of the local habit of speeding up to beat the red. You know what we do in Philadelphia? It's crazy. We speed up at yellow lights. Um, and then in Cedar Rapids, because we're turning we're turning all these streets to, to two-lane two-ways. Um, we're actually eliminating 11 of the 17 signals in the downtown core. And each one of those was slated for a $150,000 upgrade. So you can see that's how we're saving the money. You don't have push buttons in your downtown. You do not want push buttons. In your push button street networks are not pedestrian-friendly street networks, and don't let anyone tell you otherwise. And I won't get into why, but that's just a fact. Then there's this. I try not to make too many enemies 
Well, maybe one enemy. Um, but I was shown this plan for Platt and Tejon. And what we've heard is that there's a lot of crashes at Platt and Tejon. And so the proposal is to turn this four-laner and four-laner into a five-laner and a five-laner. And the theory is that having a dedicated turn lane will reduce the crashes. There could be some cases in which that may be true. But I have never, ever heard of any circumstance where turning a four, where turning a four lane street to a five lane street made it safer. I've never heard, oh, that street's dangerous, let's add some lanes. <laughs> let's make it wider. Instead of having one car zooming past me as I turn, let's have two cars zooming past me as I turn. Is that really going to make it safer? Once again, it's expansion of capacity in the name of safety. And that's what you find over and over again, improvements. The improvements, are they always mention safety, and they always make more cars go more fast. And so I would ask you to reject this proposal. There are other solutions to this corner, but that's not it. Now you know from my talk what those solutions might be. OK, the final two, the final two categories, the comfortable and the interesting walk. Um, this one's a little counterintuitive. Humans are, uh, are, um, are, you know, we're animals. All animals simultaneously seek prospect and refuge. It's in, our, it's in our bones. We can't help it. We want to be able to see our predators, and we want to feel that our flanks are covered from attack. And if we don't feel that our flanks are covered from attack, we're not comfortable. And this is from thousands of years of evolution. So our favorite spaces have good edges. And I always say a plaza is only as good as its walls. And of course, if you can have both prospect and refuge, that's, the, that's where you pay to get on a plane to visit, right? Because it's so comfortable. So we new urbanists have been talking about this for, for a long time. You know, one to one is kind of the Renaissance ideal. Street space, three to one is great. Beyond one to six, roughly, you start to lose your sense of spatial enclosure and you no longer feel comfortable. And the space becomes socio-fugal. You flee it. So six to one, uh, Salzburg, you know, can be a dream. Uh, the opposite of Salzburg, we all know, is Houston. Um, <laughs> this is like 20 years ago. Houston is doing, if you've been to Houston recently, it's doing so much better. But the main message of this slide is that the surface parking lot, there's a couple messages in this slide. One is that the surface parking lot is the principal villain in this conversation. If you want to have good spatial enclosure, then you have to hide your parking lots. Make sure your codes put them in the back of the buildings and not in front of buildings. And then if you have to have a big parking lot, you know, it only takes 60, most buildings are about 60, most residential buildings at least are only 60 feet deep. So it really only takes a small piece of a parking lot to hide the rest of the parking lot from that street. The other lesson here is that the real footprint of this building is this, because it has to be parked. Also, the reason that these are all parking lots is because of all the speculation that this building caused. And that's a reason to have height limits. When you have height limits, which you don't have in your downtown, new buildings are lower, so they spread wider, and you use up more parking lots. But also, the sites don't sit, sit empty. The landowners aren't sitting there saying, oh, I'm going to be the next guy that Shell Oil comes to and says, let's build a tower. So they won't sell it or rent it at a reasonable price. So that's why height limits actually have the value. But anyway, the surface parking lot, you know, the principal violator of that street edge. You know, and this is a wonderfully conceived space in front of the antlers, and it would be a great space if there was a building here. Yeah. Right? You see what I mean? Um, it doesn't work because it just bleeds. It bleeds into this space. So that's why this is an important site to fill. Yeah. And, then, <laughs> and then, you know, what's your best shopping street? What's your best street? It was no accident that I was led entirely up and down one street this morning, <laughs> Tejon. I know the tricks, but look at this space. I mean, it's beautiful, it's perfect, it's about one-to-one. -one. So that's where people want to go. And then finally, the interesting walk. We humans are among the social primates. Nothing interests us more than other humans. We need signs of humanity to be interested in our walk and to continue to walk. Cars are not that interesting, right? And blank walls are not that interesting. So, I mean, this is in, this is a wonderful one-to-one -one street space, right? Perfect. This is in, in, in Grand Rapids, very walkable downtown, Grand Rapids, but no one wants to walk 
on this street, which connects the two best hotels, because when one side of the street is an exposed parking deck, and the other side is a conference facility that was apparently designed in admiration for that parking deck, <laughs> then it's just boring, right? It's boring. So, you know, I don't care how nicely you do it, or what tricks you pull out of your, you know, architect hat, parking decks are boring. I love these pictures. <laughs> and we learned from Joe Riley, mayor for 40 years of Charleston, that it only takes 20 feet of building to hide 200 feet of garage. And so this idea to set it back a little bit, if you're going to build any more parking structures, set it back a little bit. It's good to occupy the ground floor uh, with retail, but even better is just to have that little sliver of, you know, let's say attainable housing between the street and the parking garage. Um, this is one of my favorites from South Beach. It's, I call it the Chia Pet Garage. Um, <laughs> but you can see how these Art Deco storefronts were preserved. Um, and then, you know, you've got every city, every city has them, don't feel bad. But the point is, you know, does your form-based code make it, make it so you can't do this anymore? You want to make sure that you've got that 20 feet. Unfortunately, this is, you know, 8 feet and not 20. Or if it was 20 feet, you could actually build, you could stick build some condos right here. It's been done. And then public art. So I was at the NEA, you know, and I, I funded a lot of art, and it makes me very proud. And I love public art, but I, I think that it's important that we orient our public art budget towards actually making places more walkable. And so the proper place for public art is, is the blank walls and the other stuff that otherwise would be too boring to walk by and you can't fix. So you know, this is the American version. Uh, this is the European version. Um, and then once you put it up, you, get, you know, keep it clean, take care of it. But um, I'm told not to show that slide for very long. Um, so I like to end with this project. And this is a project that, that I think wraps up, wraps up the, the hierarchy, these four things I've been talking about. Um, this is in Columbus, Ohio. Has anyone been here? It's called the CAP, the CAP at Union Station by Maleka Architects. This is the convention center neighborhood of Columbus. This is the short north. And this neighborhood was really struggling because no one was walking from the convention center or any of these businesses or the huge arena that's down here. No one was walking into the short north um, because this was the walk. And the short north you know, was an ethnic neighborhood, great restaurants, galleries, other stuff, but it was really suffering um, until when it came time to rebuild this decrepit bridge, the city gave $1.9 million to the state and the state built a wider bridge and they gave these two pads to a developer who put this building there. And as you can see, that it made the highway disappear. And now these two neighborhoods are absolutely seamlessly connected. And the, you know, for $2 million of city money, it's completely revived this neighborhood. And according to the newspaper articles, not, not the planning journals, the newspaper articles, this bridge is why the short north is now the hottest neighborhood in Columbus. So the lesson here is you know, when you have walkability that's near walkability, but something between them, it doesn't have to be a highway, it might be like three Jiffy Lubes, you know? Just something that's wrecking that connection, that's a place to look first, perhaps, to make the most effective investment. So that's it, you've gotta do all of them. I think, you know, here, um, the shorter term opportunity, you know, what the city can influence and change the most quickly is obviously the second category, the safe walk. And I really advocate that you do that sort of audit where you compare the volume on your streets to the capacity of your streets, and you'll find tremendous opportunity to make your streets much safer, um, much more quickly. I will, I'll be rushing out the back so that I can meet people immediately at the book table, but I will be taking Q&A now. Um, that's the book. These are the other two books if you're a real junkie, Suburban Nation. By the way, the Wall Street Journal article that called it the Urbanist Bible was a, was a negative review. Because, <laughs> you know, they don't, Wall Street Journal doesn't really, isn't necessarily pro-city. And then uh, the Smart Growth Manual. And then finally, if you want two full days of this, I teach a course at Harvard every summer. Uh, and this summer, it's June 23rd and 24th. And it's not cheap, but you get a piece of paper that really makes it look like you went to Harvard <laughs> that you can put on your wall. So um, contact me or Harvard if you want to go to this course. And because I'm on Twitter, my self-worth is a function of my number of followers. So it's Jeff Speck, AICP. I look forward to questions. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Jeff. Um, we have a few mics if you 
have a question, if you could raise your hand, because um, we want to capture a question on the mic. This is being videotaped, and so you have to talk into the mic to be remembered for posterity. So. Mike right here, and there's the running man. One of the distinctive um, characteristics of our downtown are our landscaped medians, which your friends, the traffic engineers, have, in my view, assaulted over the last decade by putting in left turn lanes. I'm wondering if you think it might be a good idea to take those left turn lanes out and restore our historic landscape medians. So the... Um, the left-hand turn lane is a very efficient tool. I'm often turning four-lane streets into three-lane streets because actually a three-lane street with a left-hand turn lane can handle as many trips as a four-lane street because of the tremendous inefficiency of a fast lane also being a turning lane, if that makes sense. So left-hand turn lanes have their role. I would be worried about putting a left-hand turn lane, removing a left-hand turn lane, if it is a street in which we could actually eliminate two of the four other lanes. Do you understand? <clears throat> Cascade is being considered, I think, quite seriously for a road diet that would make it a two-lane street. Do you know that? Yeah. And I believe that Public Works supports it. That is huge. But a two-lane street with left-hand turn lanes will handle a lot more cars than just a two-lane street. And therefore, I'd be wary to, put the, to remove the left-hand turn lane if it's going to get in the way of that sort of thing. With that caveat, I agree that the, um, for, road, for streets in which um, it isn't going to eliminate... For streets... Okay, let me make this in a concise sentence. For streets in which eliminating a left-hand turn lane will not eliminate the chance to eliminate two other lanes... I'm all for reinstating the median. And again, it's a car count issue. You look at the car counts and that tells you, you know, a three-lane street, two lanes plus a left-hand turn lane, can easily handle 17,000 cars a day. So what are the car counts? You know, that's what you need to know. A two-lane street, let's say we get rid of, let's say we take Cascade, we get rid of the left-hand turn lanes and the other extra lanes. Okay, is it 10,000 cars per day? Then we can do that too. Uh, uh, bring the mic to someone and that will decide who speaks. <laughs> yeah, hi, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Bob Wolfson. I'm interested in a project that I keep bumping into the issue of parking. The issue of parking, yeah. Because this is designed to be affordable housing. It could be 30 to 50 units. And the challenge, as I understand it, is that each unit requires one parking space as a minimum. And so... Yet, if we're going to do something like of that size in our relative core, then we bump into the issue of needing a lot more land for parking. Yes. I'm also understood and the from cost. with the developers that going underground is perhaps not a choice because of the associated expense. It's very expensive. So, so what you talked a little bit about the idea of commandeering space. Uh, is that a legal issue that cities have to consider in terms of giving parking space away in specific parking garages? I mean, how would you land a building of that size? We're talking about 30, if maybe 50,000 square feet. Let's say 45 units, 50 units. Yeah. Well, you, there are you enough. There, there, you know, what you need, it's not commandeering. It's offering. I mean, you're taking a public lot and actually offering it to a developer. And you, what you need is... In addition to all the empty nighttime spaces, which you have, you need some, and that's why I had Susan take me to the top of your parking decks today. You, you need to have some daytime vacancy too, because some of the residents won't drive to work, right? So uh, it's, a, it's a much lower ratio, but you need to have some daytime vacancy and, and a lot of nighttime vacancy. But the idea of floating you know, 50 or 100 units based on the amount of vacancy you have right now seems to make, make sense. More than that, you've got to start looking elsewhere. Now, the real estate community will insist on a certain amount of parking. The lenders will insist. There will be the one crazy developer who says, I don't care. It's probably not Earl. But there'll probably be one developer who says, I think there's a market for 100 really small units downtown 
that don't have any parking. Or maybe they build five or 10 or 15 and just see how it goes. Because the, you know, the, the prime candidate for downtown living is the millennial who doesn't want to own a car. That's the prime candidate. Some of them will, some of them won't. But you know, if 5% of the market doesn't want to own a car and wants to live downtown, then you'll get all of those people in your building that doesn't offer the parking, right? The question is, is the city requiring in certain parts of downtown, there are no parking requirements for anything. So that's good. But the question is, in other parts, is the city requiring a parking space that a developer, that a developer might not want to provide? In which case, the city should, should be changing its rules. The city will have trouble changing its rules because neighbors will fight it. Many cities, when they try to lower their on-site parking requirements, the neighbors come out and they're very afraid that they will lose their on-street parking, which they currently enjoy, to this new influx of residents who will take it over because there's no parking in the building that they're going to. And that is a completely legitimate concern, which is why whenever a city wants to do a parking reduction plan, I always say, first, you have to do a parking preservation plan. And you have to create, and the policy tools are very available and they work on you know, uh, resident permit parking programs and other things, you need to create a program where you can look a resident in the eye and say, I guarantee you, you will not lose your on-street parking space. That's what they did for us in Washington, D.C. when a ton of people were moving right next to our house. And we relied on on-street parking in Washington, D.C. So um, a lot of cities don't make that first effort to ensure residents won't lose their spaces, and that's why they're stopped from reducing the parking minimums. Next question. The mic decides. Good evening, my name is Alan and I'd like to thank you for bringing bicycles so prominently into a walkable city uh, presentation. You spent a lot of time on Tejon today and that street, myself I don't consider it that cycling friendly. So on a street that has the, the two lanes with a third center turn lane and then the diagonal parking where you see all the bikes weaving, how could we <coughs> make that more cycling friendly, especially looking right. at we're bringing bike share. So my understanding is that um, there are two streets that aren't Tejon that are being investigated for, for buffered bike lanes. They are and Cascade and Weber. And you know, when you're talking about introducing protected bike lanes to a downtown, it's not every street. You really, in, in a downtown your size, you want to have an, a, probably a north-south pair and then occasional east-west pairs. Um, but it isn't every street. Um, having a bit west of the center of downtown, one protected lane and a bit east, another protected lane, that would be fantastic. Now I should say, in a street like Tejon, I'd be very interested in seeing what a center bike lane would look like. Because actually when you have that 45 degree parking, you only need one car lane to back up. You're not going into that middle lane. Now the challenge there, and the challenge for lots of other things you could do on your streets, is truck loading. And this is a condition you find in city after city where there is a solution, and the solution is to have designated loading zones, you know, one per block edge, or maybe two. Depends how big they are. You don't want to lose too much of your on-street parking to these truck loading zones. But you, and then, of course, you want to make sure that if there's alley access to a, to a, a commercial business that the truck uses the alley, and not the street. So you need to have some enforcement component as well. First there's an education component, then there's an enforcement component. But, but you need to, um, to provide alternative places for the trucks to make delivery where they're not in the middle of the street and then that space becomes available. Next with the mic. Down here, this, this, this woman's been asking for a while. And this gentleman as well. Thanks. So when you um, showed the slide that They've replaced the traffic lights with four-way stops. Uh, I wanted to applaud. But um, what are your thoughts on, instead of four-way stops, using traffic circles? Roundabouts. Roundabouts, yes. I didn't discuss roundabouts in my book because one of my clients is Carmel, Indiana, where the mayor has installed 70 roundabouts. And it works. It works very well in Carmel. I like to say that roundabouts are the safest most pedestrian friendly automotive environment you can create. And what I mean by that is that like my swoopy Las Vegas image, 
they still communicate an uh, environment of motion and of automobiles. They are safe. You know, when, the, when there's an accident, you call the tow truck, not the ambulance, right? Um, but they don't create that feeling of stasis and of kind of urbanity that you typically want in a downtown intersection. Now, in more suburban areas, in streets that might encircle your downtown, um, they're, they're a good solution. Um, but I would much rather see a four-way stop. And by the way, the principal legitimate complaint about a four-way stop is pollution. Because when cars stop and start and stop and start and stop and start, they're burning a lot more fuel. But I try and kind of zoom out to the big picture, which is if they make a more walkable environment, then there are fewer people driving and more people walking. So actually, that perhaps outweighs the pollution argument as well. Eventually, electric cars, yeah, which where I live are fueled by coal. <laughs> yeah, next. Hi. Um, because I moved down from the mountains onto Platte to, to be part of the downtown, I'm interested in all the comments about the speeding on Platte, which I've witnessed, and I noticed that you put the slide in that showed kind of an area that I'm in. Roundabouts was something I was wondering about, and uh, the education as far as narrowing to stop the the speeding. Um, I'm curious as far as when you block the ability to turn left, as has happened between Union and Hancock, does that not invite speeding and then it goes into the wider street and then you're going even faster and now you can go even faster to go into the viaduct and how would bike lanes help that issue through the middle median, yeah. uh, a trolley, you know, how can that be taken care of? I think the speeding issue going into downtown adds crazy to the stress of the people. Who so the question there. with Platt is um, it's not consistently five or six feet too wide. It varies. And um, one thing that would really help Platt that I've seen done in other similar streets in other cities is, um, is curb extensions embracing the parking. I talked to a woman tonight who's afraid to park on Platte because her car thinks her car is going to be hit, because they are hit. Um, so curb extensions, maybe multiple per block, that protect the parked cars and let people really know what the actual width of the driving part of the street is, is really important. If there's a consistent width on any block, frankly, I mean, you don't want to do a one block bike lane. It's just dumb. But if there's a consistent width on any block, that has an extra five feet in it, I might put the bike lane in anyway, just to force the people five feet away from the, the cars. 10, 10, five, and eight, for example. Right? So that's a solution, too. And a street like Platte is the kind of street where a roundabout might make sense, because it's not really downtown. Right? Let's do one more, just out of courtesy to all of you. We'll do one more, and then I'll take the rest of the questions at the book table. And you don't need to buy a book to ask me a question. <laughs> right in front. Uh, thanks for your practical uh, suggestions. I kind of wanted to draw out a little bit, um, and I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit to uh, value sets um, that drive our economy. So when I look at a couple of your first slides, you talked about the Industrial Revolution uh, driving kind of some suburban concepts. And I see a lot of the um, uh, parking areas, uh, it appears, kind of often appear to be driven by corporations or you know the massive towers that you've shown uh, in Houston. I wonder if you could speak a little bit to the, the trajectory of our culture from like an economic standpoint um, that drive walkability and what we can do to uh, create cultural change towards a more walkable space. I'm just a caveman. <laughs> <laughs> but I actually have an answer to your question. Um, the real, the real, I mean this isn't exactly what you're asking because I, I don't feel qualified to really answer what you're asking but um, what we're seeing is that cities, as always, are competing for corporations, they're competing for talent, and they're competing for citizens, always. I mean, that's, that's what cities do. It used to be, and this is, I'm quoting the economists, not the planners, it used to be that, that the strategy for growing a city uh, or having a more vital city was to create some sort of tech cluster or aerospace cluster or um, offer a tax cut to some company that it would move there and bring a bunch of jobs and that sort of thing. That's fundamentally changing. 
And more and more cities now, now know, and this is why, you know, I'm, I'm employed by a lot of Republican cities. They're all about, like, economics and growth. And they say, you know, we want to thrive. Therefore, we have to be a place where people want to be. Because the workforce is mobile. And the educated workforce is super mobile. And they'll go to a place where, you know, 64% of millennials first decide where they want to live, and then they move there, and only then do they look for a job. So if you want to attract millennials, by the way, 77% of whom say they want to live in America's urban cores, if you want to attract that sort of person, you have to provide the environment they, that they want. If you become a place where people want to be, then you will attract people, they will bring economic energy and be your future. And if you don't attract millennials, you don't have a future. Right? Think about it. So, um, so that's my value set conversation. I'll see you at the book table. Thank you so much.